Hey guys, thanks for coming out. So uh, to get started, before we talk about the museum, I'm interested if you could just uh, talk a little bit about how the two of you first met each other, got to know each other. What, what's the story of you two? Uh, we met at a party. We both had done comedy at the UCB, which is like an improv theater in the city. And they have uh, like every year like a New Year's Eve party at a terrible bar. Uh, and so we both were there and not having fun. Um, and then we just um, kind of said hi, I guess. But then we didn't see each other for like a year afterwards. We got donuts once in between. Yeah, I kept on trying to make him my best friend. And uh, I knew that that was going to happen, but he was like avoiding it. Uh, <laughs> and then, like I started a like, asking everybody, "Where's my Harkins?" And like he came over to like film this um, web series I was doing with my roommate's cats called Theatric Cats, and um, <laughs> it was like we would choose a play and like have the cats act it out. And he came over, and we just like had so much fun, and then like started hanging out like every day and like working together and stuff. And so, and then like a few months later, we moved in together. Awesome, cool. So moved in together, we're roommates, and then one night you decide to watch the film uh, on Netflix, Price of Gold, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And could you quickly, for those of us who maybe have forgotten a little bit of the details of what that movie recounts, give like a brief overview of, uh, of the story of Price of Gold. So fun. Uh, it's, uh, do, do you know, there's a 30 for 30 series on Netflix. You can watch it, but it's ESPN. And there are all these documentaries about sports. But this one was about Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan, because uh, I wouldn't have watched any of the other ones. Uh, they're all like, the other ones are good. They're just, it's like Dennis Leary talking about baseball. Um, but this one, uh, I just started watching and then immediately started texting Viviana. You told me to come home. Yeah. And then we had to watch it together. So good. So the story is basically, it just goes through the events in 1994, focusing on that, but really focuses on Tanya Harding, because it was made right around the 20th anniversary. So they had two different documentaries. One of them, Nancy and Tanya did. That was the NBC one, because NBC offered Nancy the opportunity to be a commenter on the Olympics. This one, she kept saying maybe she'd do, but then she eventually didn't. So they really just focused on Tanya. And that's what got us so passionate, because we do feel she's you, an American hero. If you like remember the story at all, you just kind of remember the parody of Tanya Harding and like how it's like the, you think of the sex tape, and you think of just like like the mad TV kind of like version of it. And then you watch the documentary, and it's like just this woman who came from nothing. You know, all she really had was ice skating. And she makes it to the pinnacle of that. She makes it to the Olympics twice. And she's the first American, not just the first woman, but the first American to land the triple axel. These are all things that we had never, ever, ever heard about, because we were like six or seven when it happened. Mm -hmm. And then like to see her like, just like she made a few like bad choices. She was around the wrong people. And then like she like comes from nothing. She like reaches like the pinnacle and then she just loses everything you know and then it's just it's it's fascinating and we were so excited about talking about it and nobody else had also just seen it so that's kind of how we ended up making a museum right and really quickly just the facts so we can all all recall 1994 olympics mm -hmm. yes right uh the the qualifications right Bef instead of me just saying it and you confirming, <laughs> maybe it's better if you just lay this out because your knowledge is a bit better than mine. So yeah, Tanya Harding, she was the first American to land a triple axel in 1991. And then at the same time, Nancy, both her and Nancy were showing up in competitions. And then like fast forward a few years later, they're 24 and 25. So this is really the last year that they're going to be able to compete. And right before the qualifying championships for competing in the Olympics, uh, Nancy Kerrigan is attacked at the arena where everyone's practicing. Um, and at first they have no clue like what ha who did this, but really quickly it becomes pretty evident that Tanya Harding's husband was definitely involved, and then the suspicion is then that Tanya Harding was involved in planning the attack itself. Yeah, then a media frenzy followed, and this was right before the O.J. Simpson thing, so it was like months of just every day the story changed, and it just it just kind of took over. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I, I do want to talk about the media reaction, but before that, you guys saw this documentary. You you really enjoyed it. You thought there was a story that that was worth telling. I feel like a lot of people watch documentaries and have similar reactions. Very few of them decide to take that and then go build a museum in their apartment based on the documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. how how did that that idea come about? Well, the apartment, we moved, we'd moved in there a month before, and it was the first place we looked at because it had two rooms away from each other. And it didn't have like a living room, but it had a really long hallway. 
and we're like, oh, well, you know, do something with this. Uh, and then uh, he was working at a museum at the time, and he, there was actually a text exchange. He was like, nobody at the museum wants to talk about Tanya and Nancy. And I said, ha, 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 you're making it the Tanya and Nancy Museum. And then like, I think like 4 a.m. the next day, I was like, man, <laughs> now we're going to make it the Tanya and Nancy Museum. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly how it happened. <laughs> and when you, at that early stage, when you're thinking, we're going to start a museum, did you have any sense of what, what it would mean to you to form a museum, the type of things you would be looking for to, to have in it? The original plan and the original Kickstarter, we were asking for $75 to blow up pictures and put them in the hallway. And um, we figured like that would be enough, you know? And uh, it, it was like, oh, this will be a fun, funny thing. You know, you'll come over and you'll walk down this dark hallway and see pictures of Tanya and Nancy. And, crazy and then like we launched the kickstarter and then i mean we didn't really think ahead of time oh there is a figure skating community but i mean of course there's a figure skating community and we started they started reaching out to us and um the first person we met that really took it from like joke to like oh we have like this is going to change everything was lois elfman who was a um who's a figure skating reporter journalist and uh she contacted us right away and was like I have artifacts for you. And so we met with her. She gave us like all this amazing stuff that she'd had in her house, like, um, like. A book, a scoring book from 1990, um, with Nancy and Tanya's face on the same page. Then she gave us backstage passes that she had for different championships. Of, the, of the one where the attack happened Yeah, there was well. one, there was a ticket for the, uh, the Joe, uh, Joe Louis Cobo Arena in Detroit. Original pictures of Nancy Kerrigan that she took, and then like this one pin from that championship, and she was just like, it was so important to her, like, and she gave it to us, and then like we kind of got home and we were like, okay, we have to like really try, you know? And so we went to Michael's and got oh, yeah. so many shadow boxes. And then more, and then so people started making art, and people started like sending us other things, and so we kind of just came up with this hub for it. And then I, I mean, like, so it did start as like a joke, but like we we put so many hours and like so much love into it, like, and and we're just so committed to it that it's it's very real to us. Yeah, one of the so I've been to the museum at their apartment, and one of the other interesting things I think you do is you really follow not only the events of the incident but also how the media talked about the incident afterwards. It's not only uh, documenting the skaters, but it's documenting how we as a nation kind of responded to the skaters. Yeah, the thing is, that's like the craziest thing. I feel like, especially with Tanya Harding, uh, it's like amazing that she didn't kill anyone because like the things that she had to go through are insane. And if it was me, I would have like, First off, I wouldn't have even, I wouldn't have even, I would, I would be in a basement somewhere. But uh, <laughs> she, like, you know, she came from just like a terrible upbringing, and then from there, you know, achieved so much. But then also, you know, once it starts coming out that she might be involved, there's so much press like thrown her way. And at first, when you watch it, she seems excited because it was one of the big things that she had to go through was seeing how unfair it was that other figure skaters who kind of were more like in line with what people thought figure skaters should be would get endorsement deals that she just wouldn't get despite the fact that she was like so talented. So when she first gets this attention, she's excited, but then it's, it's obviously not good attention and it just builds and builds to the point where people are like, you know, getting her truck towed so that she'll run outside and they can like, you know, attack her with questions, uh, you just swarm her basically. And she also has like no team around her. like. Nancy has a full staff, basically agents, you know, coaches. People were just pulling back from Tanya, so she's doing this all on her own, and still gets herself to the Olympics. But it's that moment that was the thing that we relate to the most, which was at the Olympics. There's just the total meltdown because she's it's her second program. She's planning on doing a triple axel, which she hadn't been able to do since early in the 90s. But it was her way of sort of saying, OK, well, this will make them forget all that other stuff that people are talking about. And then halfway through her program, she stops because she messes up a jump. She had a problem with her laces before. She showed up late. So it was just watching it all kind of just like crash. And like all of those events, like it feels like kind of like the birth of reality TV. Because like that, that performance is still one of like the seven most watched things live still to this day, right? Event, yeah. yeah. And so it's like, and then like every day, like you just had these two women, you know, and every day you were following just every little thing they were doing and just impressing so much on it. So it's, it, it, it just, it, it feels like it was foreshadowing so much of today, you know? And they made them into these like 
like, uh, I don't know what the word is, but it was just like Nancy was very much the ice queen, and then Tanya was just like the trash. And that was like how they were constantly presented. Um, and it, it's like, it's just not true. But and it that's was, what we like try to do as much as possible in the museum is like kind of cut away from that, you know, and, and talk about like, you know, them as athletes, you know, and we try to like show them at like their best and um, yeah, separate them as much as possible from the media storm because it, there would have there would have been nothing new to say if we were just like kind of going off of um, of. Uh, but that's all inspired by the documentary too. It's so good, um, and we got to meet the um, director of that, so that was very cool. She came by, um, but yeah, it, so it's just it's really she told the story best, and we're just like mimicking the movie. <laughs> yeah, all we're doing is making sure we keep having the conversation that we wanted to have with a bunch of people all the time, but nobody was, you know, ready. So anybody who comes over, it's, you know, it's like fun and everything, but then we just have, we get to talk about what we wanted to talk about to begin with, which was just how good this movie is. Good this movie is. <laughs> so you guys do have this interesting aspect of your museum where, so in order to view the museum, people send you an email, mm -hmm. and you respond and send up a time with them to come visit, and then you're essentially welcoming these strangers into your apartment to, to view the museum. Uh, what was that like to make the decision to just sort of open the doors to, to whoever can, can send you an email? Um, I think like it was just like, oh, well, first we were like, we'll meet people downstairs. You know, that was like, that, that seemed to us like some amazing safeguard, <laughs> like that if we meet them on the corner by the bodega. Like if they're crazy, we just won't have them up few problems with that, we got so lazy and like stopped meeting people downstairs because yeah. we were just like, just come up. We So many people have our buzzer code. <laughs> and um, and this, the second part is like, you go downstairs, you meet somebody who's creepy and like, <laughs> we do not have it in us to say, no, you can't come upstairs. So yeah. we have let some weird people just inside. But nobody's like hurt us. Um, I think like, it takes like, uh, the, like the appeal out of it for like serial killers or something because they're going to be such easy prey. Yeah, they um, like the chase. Yeah. <laughs> but like honestly, like anybody who's like interested in it are people like us, you know? Uh, and that's really who we've met. And people who like figure skating documentaries, um, and uh, people who like kitsch and camp. So it's it's been so so fun. The other most fun part I think is just in seeing how people approach that. Like like just seeing like who shows up late, who inside the apartment, uh, like was was one time there was a huge huge group of people. Uh, and they then invited their friends over. Oh, that was terrible. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then their friends came. And, and they like, invited somebody else too, I think. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some it was guy. like three people. And yeah. the guy didn't talk at all, um, which was like fine. But she kept going around. It's a very small apartment. And it's very like, small. I, it's like, yeah, you're in our apartment, whatever. But also, she kept going into our bedrooms to like look around. <laughs> and was like, you can't do that. That's not right. Like, yeah. I mean, we did not say anything, though. You know, we also don't like confrontations. Oh, yeah, so no. Maybe this is not a thing to set up for us, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, And there, there is sort of this new movement, especially in New York, of, like, the micro-museum, right? So there's, like, uh, the Museum of Morbid Anatomy and, and, and uh, Museum I've heard about in Chinatown, the museum in an elevator. Mm -hmm. Have you guys been in touch with other people involved in sort of this micro-museum movement? Not so much. No. We, uh, we reached out to a, a bunch of different museums a while ago, just about like when we didn't know what would happen with like the collection that we have. Yeah. Uh, and the response was uh, <laughs> not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not super respected in the museum community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, uh, yeah, but it, it's fun seeing like those other things pop up, you know. And I think like uh, we didn't know this at the time, but there was also like in the '90s there was like a troll museum in some woman's apartment in like the Lower East Side. And I think it's, it's, I mean, it's so appealing because, like, there's the, the idea of, like, the Route 66 museum where it's, like, museum of spoons, you know, and uh, that's, so, that's so fun, you know, so it's nice to see it in, um, coming back a little bit. And you guys have gotten quite the variety of press uh, for the museum. You've been featured on TV and radio and in magazines we were just talking about. Um, what do you think it is about the museum that sort of captures people's interest in, you know, in that kind of way? I think the first the first round um, definitely just talking about Tanya and Nancy again, you know, because it instantly like it, you remember where you were, how you remember it, you know, um, and then I think also the fact that it was in a hallway um, was was appealing, 
Yeah. Because people like to go into other people's houses uh, if they can. <laughs> There's some museum in France that's it's like an old house, and it's run by a guy who lives there. Uh, and like you book an appointment, and you go to see the house, and he just kind of walks around with a shirt off in the background, uh, like makes eggs. <laughs> uh, and it's like people go because they get the story of like, oh, he was so weird. Uh, so I feel like that's also like a thing that people. I think yeah, I think a lot of people come just to see see the freaks. You know? Yeah, kind of a little bit like that. Yeah, and it really does feel like we're freaks when we're, when it's just one of us. Like if it's both of us together, it's fun because it's sort of uh, like we play off each other or whatever. But if it's just one of us, especially if it's one of us and then a couple on a date, it's like right. <laughs> very creepy. Yeah. The third wheel museum curator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was one time there was like these two people and it just really seemed like they just wanted to hang out in there alone. So I kind of backed off. Uh, <laughs> and then I just was, there's nowhere for me. I'm not going to lie down. <laughs> we don't have like a We don't have a couch or anything. Yeah, there's no couch. So I just kind of sat and then just kept peeking my head in. And I was like, you doing okay? <laughs> and they were just like, yeah, we're fine. <laughs> and then they left. <laughs> So uh, Googlers, as a bunch, were pretty creative people. If anyone here was interested in starting their own museum about a certain topic, you know, in their apartment or some other small museum, do you have advice about what to do to start that, what to do to make that successful for someone else? Definitely eBay is great because oh, great. you can just get a lot of stuff on there. And it's so cheap, it's shocking. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like honestly insane how cheap some of these things are. You can get a magazine, and I just looked, there's magazines, uh, that like you know have OJ on the cover and they're like they're three dollars. I don't know why. I don't know. For me, it seems like that should be a lot of money, but uh, they're very cheap. And then they have um, you know they have these ton uh, Nancy Kerrigan trading cards, which were I'd like still pretty cheap. Like they're like thirty dollars, yeah. and they don't make them anymore. Yeah, those they're, are artifacts. That's it. And so we we've been giving them away, but the people who come. But like uh, <laughs> there's so much stuff on eBay. There's even. Um, uh, Oh, I just saw this also because I just was looking for OJ theme stuff because it's like that show's on. Um, but they have a, a juror pin that says like uh, designated TV juror, which is so creepy. Uh, and that's for sale on eBay for like two dollars if you want it. And maybe not. <laughs> so go for it. Yeah. Um, but I think like the big thing is like I mean it's, you know there's the internet as you know, uh, so it's so easy to connect with people who are interested in what you're interested in, and that's. That's really why this was so fun and, and I think caught on a little bit uh, because uh, we could just connect with other people who like the idea, you know, and then they, they've come from like all over. We've met people from Australia and um, we're in contact with the guy who runs the Tanya Harding fan club in New Zealand. Um, his name is Terry. He is very dedicated. Um, and uh, it's just all these people that, you know, in another time we would not know existed, you know, and so it's, it's been great. Great. And you guys are working now on a follow-up or a special exhibit from the Tanya Harding Nancy Kerrigan Museum. Could you uh, explain to everyone what that is that you're working on? Yes, we're very excited. Um, one of the artists who um, had made us a drawing for the permanent collection, uh, Laura Collins, she lives in Chicago, and she has a series called The Olsen Twins Hiding from Paparazzi. Of paintings and uh, they're hiding behind Birkin bags and Starbucks cups and blackberries so we want to bring that here um, it's very jarring to see like a whole wall of women hiding their face from you which is very creepy and fun mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna have uh, special installations inside the museum like a selfie station where you can hide behind a giant blackberry yeah, we made a giant blackberry. It's to scale, and all the shift keys do what they would. Uh, it doesn't turn on, but it looks the way it should. Uh, so you kind of hide behind it. Uh, we just wanted to be interactive, and also just to kind of have fun with uh, nostalgia in general, because there's so much of it now. And I feel like uh, it is always like creepy when people post a GIF of the Olsen twins saying like like some famous line, because it's always like to me at least. That's just a child who some adult yelled at for 20 minutes before. Is like, you say this, you say it right. And then it's like, everyone's like, so cute. <laughs> uh, so I feel like this is a fun way to kind of like go like even, like another step forward. It's like, oh, yeah, this, if we're into being nostalgic about this, like, here's how creepy it can be. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it also uh, sort of continues that conversation. You know, like you talked about like the beginnings of reality TV, sort of early 90s, as the Olsen twins also became a part of the media narrative as well. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely carries that on. Like, 
And when I was a kid, like, I was a big Mary-Kate and Ashley fan, and I went to, like, this theme park to, to like, meet Mary-Kate and Ashley. And, like, you wait in line for, like, three hours, and it just, like, got more and more, like, depressing and weird. And then, like, you pass by them, and they're just sitting there, and they're both like this. And it was just like, oh, I'm so sorry for looking at you. And, um, and they, like, grew up in that, and then, like, the second they really hit 18, like, they just, like, went into hiding, which is just so cool, I think. And I feel like they did their work. And still, like, they can't walk, they can't walk down the street, you know? And um, so, yeah, just highlighting that, uh, but in a fun way with a giant blackberry, you know? And we'll also have a, a model of a table at Mary Kate's wedding, because there was, when she got married on Black Friday last year, um, there was an article in, like, two places about how she had bowls and bowls of cigarettes uh, at each table. Uh, which was Drew very us in fun. immediately, <laughs> yeah. and we said that is glamorous. Because there's no photos. Everyone had to turn their phones in. Um, the only like story is just that it was so smoky inside, and you couldn't see anything. Um, so we'll have uh, a table like that. We have a model of it now with with teeny tiny little cigarettes that I spent too much time making. <laughs> And you guys are still looking for some uh, art patrons for your Kickstarter that's going on right now to finish yes. that up. Our Kickstarter is running until uh, Sunday at 7, and um, we're asking for more than $75 this time because we want to run a storefront and do a lot of cultural events and then ship the art here. That's very expensive, uh, apparently. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it'll be really fun if we get to do it. So yeah, check that out. It's also, we like met so many people with our last project that this one it's so cool to kind of try and continue those relationships at the last minute we had a museum gala for our uh tanya harding museum um and viviana's sister was in town and she found on groupon a guy who was who made cupcakes and did deal for us to bring cupcakes there and they were so good so he is going to have a pop-up mini shop in the pop-up gallery uh with cupcakes with all the art on it and we've gotten like submissions already like this guy did this painting of um, the Olsen twins hiding from dinosaurs instead of paparazzi. So it's really fun to see like what people come up with and like just like it's just a way to say like hey let's make some more art and like put it together and you know that kind of stuff. Do, do you guys feel like there's enough uh, sort of pop culture interesting topics in your life that this is something you can see yourselves continuing continuing to do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, uh, as long. I think it's just trying to find other people who maybe are as passionate. Uh, but I think there's a million things though. I would see like an SVU exhibit. That could be very fun. Yeah. Uh, just a lot of pictures of iced tea. Love that. Uh, <laughs> and there's so much good fan art online and. People I make mean, beautiful fan art. Oh, they make such beautiful fan art, and a lot of times it's like a joke, but it's like they have created something that beautiful. is so good. And it's about everything. HGTV shows, there's fan art, of like, of there's fan fiction, too. Um, or like, if you watch Love or List It, uh, yeah, it's a great show. And it, um, it, uh, they have these two hosts, Hillary and David, and they have great chemistry. I sound very old, but I love them. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's fan fiction about them. Nothing happens, but it's just about, like, you know. Erotic fan fiction yeah. is what he's talking about. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, so we have a microphone down in the second row. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask Matt and Viviana about uh, the museum or the skaters or anything at all. Hello. Hi. Hi. So what is your favorite artifact that you've collected, if you had to choose one? I think definitely. Well, my favorite piece of art is um, there's these two cross stitches of Tanya and Nancy, and uh, they're kind of facing each other. And their shading on them is insane. They're like so beautiful. As far as artifacts, um, what do you think? Um, I mean, I like the magazine. There's a National Enquirer magazine we got off of eBay because it's just, uh, I think a lot of times people would sort of say like, um, uh, like how, do you think, how much do you think has changed since 1994? But if you look at one of these magazines, like absolutely nothing. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're all the same and they're great because they're, you know, they're just about uh, different famous people um, and there's like, Especially the National Enquirer, they have a lifesavers section. There's an article about Sharon Stone saving a choking victim. Um, but if you look at that, they're no different than any website that's around now. It's just if it would happen today, I think there'd be a much more, uh, like, there'd be, like, Twitter, there'd be any sort of social media where people could say, hey, let's maybe not, like, uh, look at it this way. And I think there'd be more, I, I guess, just a, more outlooks on something. Because uh, it is very, when you look at the magazines, which were really the place people were going, 
it's just insane how uh, you know sexist, how stupid some of these just uh, spins on the story were. Hello. Hi. So I have a bunch of questions I could ask, but I'll <laughs> keep it to the good ones. Um, I noticed on the Kickstarter page that you mentioned something about the uh, like an ongoing investigation of the way women are portrayed in the media, which you just kind of alluded to. So it's interesting because I think to a casual observer, there's a certain, it seems like a very kind of almost kitschy attitude, but there is also like a relatively serious and important critical attitude that now these kind of two exhibits are taking on. So do you think that it would be dangerous to push it more in that serious direction in terms of how you market it, or is that part of what you're trying to do? I think, I think the, that is not for us to talk about. We're going to bring the kitsch, <laughs> and we think that's Let a conversation other people piece. should have. Right. But we definitely aren't smart enough to sound yeah. smart about it. Oh, but I don't we, know if that's we, true. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I think like the idea of um, Tanya and Nancy just being obliterated by the media and uh, just kind of ruined their lives in so many ways. And same thing with the Olsen twins. Um, we're, we want to bring the, the fun aspect of it. And um, we, definitely, we definitely hope it gets people talking and thinking about um, the seriousness of it. Because it is, it is so jarring um, to like celebrate or like have fun in that, you know? Um, yeah, that's basically the conversation we had at first. Like, like when we first watched the documentary, all we wanted to talk about was how awfully America treated Tanya Harding. Um, and then, but at the same time, it's like, it's kind of like, you know, it is ridiculous to be just sitting around and like forcing people to talk about this uh, in like year 2016 or whatever. Um, so it's just a mix of both, I guess. But that's, that's the fun of it is like, and there's so much of it happening now. Like even that, the, the OJ show, I keep calling it the OJ show, but uh, <laughs> they, they, yeah, that's like the whole thing. And there, I just read some interview with Marsha Clark and it was insane how like, you know, she was like picking her words so carefully because of like, how everything she had been through in the 90s and it's uh i think it's fun it's fun to look back it's and now getting the paulson treatment oh, paulson. <laughs> yeah yeah have um, you watched the, like monica Lewinsky like ted talk oh that's so she's good. it's like it's so crazy because she's she's just like so careful about every word she says you know she was bullied so so hard and she's had to go in hiding for a long time and then now she's back and she's just like I, every every breath is practiced, you know, because it could just blow up in your face again. It's just, it's crazy. It is. So, second follow-up question before I pass it to somebody else. You mentioned fan art, and I hadn't really thought about that as being the thread that goes through both of these things, although it's pretty obvious, so I'm an idiot. But <laughs> um, why isn't there a museum of fan art? Right? Yeah. Because, like, people would probably pay you to exhibit there. So it could, seems like it could be a pretty good money making opportunity. That's right? something we've thought about where it's like, if we, if we did have a storefront, like, we could, it could just be fan art, you know? And, like, how fun would that be? So the, fun. Oh, it's so fun, so you know? Fun. So give us a storefront and we'll you just do it. it. Yeah. <laughs> we had a conversation about that one night. Uh, and then there, there's some case, it's Cheryl Teague versus some artist. That's about like fan art. It just relates to that. About like the selling of fan art. I could yeah, be way off. Yeah, you guys should get in touch with Richard Prince. I feel like he'd probably be down to, you know, go in on this with you because he loves Paul. getting sued. And oh, fun. yeah, so reach out to Richard. Yeah, we haven't been sued yet, and we feel like. Yeah, if a couple Not people have let us know that they could. But. Yeah, a few people have said like I could sue you, but I won't. <laughs> Yeah, I guess while we're waiting uh, for more questions, have you guys had any any sort of contact with Nancy's people, with Tanya's people? Nancy's agency came by, um, this woman who worked there, and we were so, oh, we were so scared when she was coming yeah. because we're like, she's gonna just have a letter that tells us to stop. And I was like, I'll, I'll rip everything down, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, but no, she was so nice and great, and she said that um, she, Nancy's agent, who's also her husband, they run an agency together um, in Boston, and she brought us like a lot of like 
what it's like a signed headshot and then um, CD. a CD of Nancy's number only song she recorded. It's very housewives. It's very fun. Love comes shining through. It's called Love comes shining through. We listen to it a lot. Um, and then a Halloween and Ice DVD. And they were like really positive. They were just like, well, it's absurd but fun, you know. And then Tanya, um, we we did hear from her through Terry in New Zealand, who said that her godmother slash manager said it's cool but she's too busy to come, which is all we could ask for. Yeah. We just don't want to make anybody mad, you know. No? Come by to the museum, it's fun. Yeah, so yeah. If, if people uh, who saw this talk now or who are watching online later are super excited to come see the museum, what, what should they do? What do they do? Oh, just email us or uh, tweet at us or go to our website, THNK 1994, uh, and there's a contact form there. Um, and yeah, we're like around most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so just email us and come we'll on by. We'll make it happen. There may be like a chain of like 20 emails, but we'll, we'll make it happen. Yeah. All right, awesome. So if there aren't any more questions, let's uh, thank Matt and Viviana for coming and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.